for that. Um, getting all our streams set up here. Uh, welcome to today's Scrum Pulse. I'm Lindsay Velasina here with Scrum.org. I am going to be moderating your session today. Today we have an awesome session prepared for you focused on product ownership and why product ownership is essential. And today we have with us Sabrina Love at, from Scrum.org. She is our product owner of Courseware. And we also have two professional Scrum trainers with us. Paul Kitan and Frederick Went. So welcome everybody. We're so happy to have everyone here today and we hope you have some great questions to, um, to ask our panel. So next slide, please. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's a very quick guidelines here. So your microphones are muted, but we do encourage you to ask questions and add comments and all of that fun stuff. So you can do so through the Q&A. That's where we want you to enter your questions. Um, and then regarding the chat, if you have any comments or technical questions, things of that nature, you can put that into the chat. We want to keep the chat and the Q&A separate, however. So please make sure that you do that. And next slide, please. And just so you know, this is being recorded. Slides will be available within 24 hours. You will get a link to your inbox about that. And very quickly about scrum.org, we are the home of Scrum. And we were founded by Ken Schwaber in 2009. Our mission is to help people and teams solve complex problems. And we do that through our professional Scrum training, certification, and ongoing learning opportunities. You'll notice on the scrum.org website, there are a lot of great free opportunities to learn. So please be sure to check out our resources there. Could be super helpful. Um, you were able to find this webinar, so you've obviously explored at least a little bit, which is great. And we hope that today's session plays an important part in your learning journey um, with product ownership uh, specifically. So with that, I would like to hand it over to our panelists today to introduce themselves and get this conversation started. Sure. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sabrina Love. I'm the, the product owner of Courseware at Scrum.org, like men Lindsay mentioned earlier. Um, I'm working together closely with Frederick and Paul um, on the topic of this webinar on professional product ownership. I'm really excited to dive deeper with you here today. Um, Frederick, would you introduce yourself? Please. Okay. I, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I'm Frederick. I'm based in Sweden. I'm in the middle of it. And um, I love this thing called product. When it works well, so much fun is happening. So much great things are happening for everybody involved. Um, so um, that's a very short introduction to ba my background. I've been with scrum.org for uh, almost 10 years. So, yep. All right. My name is Paul, Paul Keiter. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, I've been at PST for about 10 years. Uh, I'm very much working with product owners and on the product end of things for quite some years now. And uh, I'm very excited to be working on this uh, together with Frederick and Serena. So. Thank you, guys. Um, just to... <laughs> set the scene a little bit um, for the topic today. There's a, there's this great quote by Peter Drucker that has, um, it will help us frame the problem that we're, that we're hoping to solve or, or things that we're hoping to dive deeper in today. Um, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently something that should not have been done at all. Um, so essentially we've, and Dave West, uh, the CEO of Scrum.org has a great story about um, the transition that we've, that we've started encountering where We've gone from being able to deliver to solving the problem of delivery uh, with the transition into the digital age to doing to now discovering how to build the right it to to reference Alberto Savoya's um, uh, comment about that. It's it's less now about finding a way to deliver, although that is still important and delivering well is still important. But now it's becoming increasingly more important to to identify and deliver the right it. Um, so I'm curious, actually, Frederick, would you agree uh, that the challenge in the world of product development uh, that we're facing today typically has to do more with building the right it as opposed to uh, building it well? Well, to be honest, I think that's been this. I mean, that's been the question all along, right? 
the people that figure out what they're right, it, they've always been able to succeed better. What I think is changing is that, as everybody knows, as we're moving into a more digitized world, and we get a faster feedback loop, and we get a faster ability to move to new markets, etc. We're learning more quickly, and we have an opportunity to learn more quickly about is this the right it um, in ways that you know you might not have the opportunity to do um, 20 years ago or something <laughs> like that or even further back so it's not i mean figuring out the right it has always been the question right uh, but the ways we're doing that has certainly changed in the last couple of 10 15 20 years something like that yeah for sure oh. we don't uh, yeah. buy an aol disc anymore for example <laughs> right no. and, and paul yeah, so 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 that's it. You know, we're we're becoming much better at uh, discovering the right it. Uh, uh, whereas thirty years ago, it was about uh, building it right, uh, and now it's more much more about building the right thing. And I think that's where the forefront of moving this product development thing forward is, and also where uh, the forefront of owning a product is. So uh, so that's really uh, important, I think. Yeah, I agree. Um, so it's looking a little bit more about uh, what the industry is like and um, you know, what is what is the cause of this challenge? Can it be tied to our orientation around ownership and products? Um, this, this slide seems to think so, right? Um, Paul, would you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, yeah so, so if you look at the, uh, uh, what companies are doing from, from these two axes, you know, the, their product orientation. Basically, to what extent are you still running projects, building solutions, or uh, making products, trying to make customers happy? So so that's the product orientation axis on the x-axis. And then you have the empowered ownership, which is the extent to which, hey, to what extent are you executing someone else's ideas? Or uh, are you executing uh, your own ideas, trying to solve problems for the company? So that's that's what the empowered access is about, and uh, you know, in general, uh, we feel there's way too much people in the left bottom corner of this, uh, uh, and 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 we want to move as much people as possible to the right top corner of this. And uh, what you see in the current situation, uh, you see the types of companies that are typically in, or the types of endeavors that are typically in these uh, quadrants today. That those are depicted behind uh, on the side of these axes. But but I I don't really care what kind of company you are. I don't really care what type of endeavor uh, you're in. Because if you're in a complex uh, world uh, developing products, uh, you're going to need to be moving from left bottom to top right. So 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 that's, that's really what uh, I think... Uh, uh, are, uh, this is all about and 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 how does that tie into product ownership and and and, and what does product ownership look like then mm -hmm. have you worked with have either one of you worked with or experienced um organizations that are working in the bottom left or in the top right and is there a noticeable difference in their behaviors or their abilities to deliver value oh certainly um and um it's also possible to move from both left to right in this scenario and it's both you know it's it's not it doesn't have to be that you always look exactly the same this thing is mo is a moving target you know people get comfortable in what happens and ways of working etc so you might you know it's not black or white that's what i'm trying to say mm -hmm. um your second question was uh, were there any noticeable difference in behavior or abilities uh, to deliver value that you've that you've observed, I guess, between uh, teams or organizations operating in in either one of those quadrants? So for so for me, the the thing that really becomes a difference is the rate of learning. Mm -hmm. yeah, because in the top right area, you are responsible and you also act on you know, you have the opportunity to, to put your own ideas to the test. And when you do that, you feel more accountable. And by doing so, you also want to know, hey, did I do something good? Uh, do people love what we're doing? Is this the right thing? Is it working out well? Are we, is it making sense to the business? Whereas where you downwards to the left, it's, you might be more disconnected from that type of feedback that will actually 
allow you to take ownership and be responsible about, you know, making sure what we're doing is right for the, both our clients and customers and our company. So they, it doesn't doesn't mean everybody in the bottom left doesn't care, not at all. Mm -hmm. But your ability to act on what you learn is much greater in the top right corner. Yeah, it's also easier to care in the top right corner. You know, right. it's the diff. It's a diff. It's sometimes it can literally be the different difference between hey, I completed this Jira ticket as opposed to I made this customer happy. So, mm -hmm. no. no. That actually might be a great segue into um, how we talk about what is professional product ownership and these these different axes uh, and how we can um, identify, you know, what do we mean by professional product ownership? Is it a role? Is it different than product managers or product or project management roles? Um, yeah. Yeah. Frederick, do you want to? So how do we slice this elephant yeah. kind of thing, this question? Yeah. Because <laughs> let's get it off the table. There, there are so many uh, ways that you can create roles and accountabilities or areas of responsibilities in a company. And uh, some might say that a product manager should be this, and some might say, but a scrum says a product owner should, blah, blah, blah. And um, at the end of the day, your company or your organization is going to own your product. All of this thing, you know, whether it's technology or business focused or long-term or more strategic or it's day-to-day -day execution of whatever needs to happen today, all of this is happening at your company. This is how you own your product. And when we get all of these quadrants playing in unison, moving towards the same direction, where we understand each other, where we're moving, et cetera, that's when you start excelling in this area of this thing called product ownership. So we don't want to tell you what the right way to organize your company is. That might have to change, you know? So uh, what you will do is you will have product ownership because as long as you have products, you need to own them. So the question is, how can you do this in a way that is meeting your business goals while also, you know, uh, satisfying your customers and markets and users and making a difference for them? Mm -hmm. And just for, for the sake of clarity, when we're talking about these axes and in relation to an accountability or in how a lot of organizations translate that accountability into a role or a person, for example, are we expecting that any one person would be able to uh, do all of these things well? Or how does delegation come into this story? No. Well, there's a lot of factors that play into that, of course. Um, it, it, there's small products and big products. There's small companies and big companies. Uh, there's uh, products that uh, are, might be small, but you need uh, a million things to even uh, get them to market. So, so that really depends on uh, on your on your situation. Uh, uh, it's just really uh, all of these things needs to be done for all products. Uh, the way you slice and dice it and make it context specific for your uh, for your specific situation, it can vary wildly. So, uh, so that's 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 really uh, not something that we really want to go into. We just want to describe what it means to own a product and what are things that are useful in owning a product, uh, regardless of how you slice it. Um, that's 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 what we we're really looking at. Delegation might be important, um, but we've mm -hmm. actually identified some some capabilities, and which I think is is kind of why a lot of people are are here today is to learn more about what we're talking about with regards to capabilities and skills of product ownership. At least I hope that's why you're here because that's what we're going to talk about. Um, <laughs> coming back to you know tying it back to our mission a little bit, um, which is to help people and teams solve complex problems, right? And we recognize that product de development is is complex. It's uh, it has to do a lot with people and their interactions and and teams and organization and everything and and anything regarding people is inherently complex, right? But we have an idea that learning how to gain these capabilities and get better at these skills doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't have to be a guessing game. Um, so we thought we'd share with you uh, some some ideas that we have about product ownership and. The result of extensive collaboration that that we've gone through and talked to a lot of people about what are these core capabilities. Um, Frederick, did you want to tell us a little bit about you know where did these things come from? Why are these? Why are why is it these three? Yeah, we googled 
No. We <laughs> <laughs> used uh, ChatGPT yes, as our board yeah. no, um, I mean, <laughs> what we're looking at right now is a condensed version of you know, so many conversations with people and so much learning that has happened throughout the years. This is a snapshot in time. You know, this is what we're thinking right now is, you know, some of the core capabilities of uh, doing product ownership in a good way. There's, there's more, you know, there's stuff that we haven't put on here. Like typically you have a lot of leadership and, and your leadership skills means you need to listen, mediate, facilitate and all of that. But so these things from the conversations with a lot of professional scrum trainers in scrum.org, but also elsewhere, this is what people see. These are the core things that make a huge difference. When these three things become strong, you start seeing a completely different leverage in this area of product ownership. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's. I think it would be nice to elaborate a bit. That you say, okay, there's also skills like leadership and all these things. Um, yeah, you need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to empathize. You need to. Uh, there's there's a lot of personal skills that are required in product ownership. That's not what we're talking about. Mm. Uh, uh, we're talking about things that are specific to owning a product. So so that's why uh, that's why uh, we uh, limit ourselves to uh, to these three actually. Yeah. And uh, if you look at them. Uh, it's it's really simple, you know. You need to be able to uh, to set direction, uh, inspire others, uh, inspire creativity, uh, um, and that's called it. Engage with vision in this case. Uh, it's about lead the value, and lead the value is all about the context. Yeah? So you're 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 building your product in a certain context, uh, and you need to be aware of that context. You need to be influencing that context. Uh, and 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 align with that context. So so that's what lead to value is all about. And then finally, we have evolve with validation, and that's all about how do you uh, how do you do it? Yeah. So how do you create value? Uh, what's the best way to create value? And of course, you know, uh, we have some experience the past thirty years on. Uh, how to be able to do that. We have a lot of enablers that allow us to better do that. Uh, and that's what Evolve with Validation is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, oh. definitely. So, you know, back to our mission once more, being uh, practical. How do we make this practical? Um, so those, those three that we just saw are the, you know, engage with vision, leading to value, and evolving with validation are what we're calling core capabilities. Um, we've also identified under these capabilities a set of skills, and I know there's a lot on this slide and we'll, we'll dive deeper, um, but we've identified some, some skills that would help you to gain those capabilities. Um, so we'll actually zero in on each one for, for a moment. Um, there is a lot here on this slide. This content is available on the website. We're not going to read it word for word here today, um, but what I really want to focus on is, you know, what is the most important thing for people with product ownership product ownership accountabilities uh, to focus their learning on when it comes to engaging with vision? Um, Frederick. Yeah, so why is vision and engagement important? Mm -hmm. So I, I think a lot of Gary Hamill, he has some great content that he shares freely with anyone interested about, <clears throat> you know, what set companies apart that are really innovative? And it starts with engagement. If you're not engaged, if you don't care, you're not going to get a lot of innovation because why should I care? I don't care. You know, that, that's, that's people do what they want. But if you really care, um, you start caring and you start, uh, um, you know, empathizing, putting yourself in their shoes. And that's when you also see possibility, some possibilities as well as opportunities and problems. So how you lead how the company leads, how a company involves people and connect them to the, to the people becomes central, right? If you want innovation, if you want engagement, people will have to be able to understand why we're doing this, where are we moving towards? How is this gonna be better for someone, this endeavor that we're on? So um, making sure that your vision really speaks about that, how it makes a life better for someone and not your company, but for the people you're doing this for, your end users or customers. 
And if you don't do this, you will get, if, if there's unclarity about where we're moving towards or why we're doing it, you will, you know, people figure out their own ideas, their reasons for going to work. And so they might start drifting off in different directions. You will have conflicts, you will lose time, it, you know, costs increase and all of that. So this is a key thing if you want to have a lot of people engaged in high level of innovation. You need to think about how you lead your leadership. Yeah. Empower teams, give them real problems to solve that they can care about. Yeah. So, so maybe maybe just one remark with regards to innovation, because yeah. Frederick talks a lot about, about innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people tend to think that innovation is something separate. Yeah? Uh, it's, a, it's a separate thing. But, but just to be clear, in, 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 our, in the way we view things, all new product development is innovation. Yeah. So, 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 to, just to make it very simple, if you're if you're a software developer on a team, um, and you're uh, building something, if all is well, you're doing it for the first time. Yeah. Because if you built the same software twice, you're doing it wrong. So, by its very nature, new the product development is innovation. So, 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 I just wanted to take away that that thing like, okay, innovation is a, is a, is a separate thing, you know, because a lot of these companies, they put innovation centers out there, but you know, that's not what innovation in our way of talking about things is about though. No. Great clarification. Thanks. Mm -hmm. No. Sure. Uh, should we dive into leading to value? I have a similar no. question. Um, you know, what is the most important thing about leading to value? Um, <clears throat> What does doing this well look like? Um, I think the most important thing about leading to value is, is being aware of your context and actively influence it. Because that's the that's the that's the only way uh, you're going to have products that are successful. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, that, I think that's the most important thing. And if you look at context, there's a there's a few elements to it. You know, there's the market. Uh, but there's also your organization. Yeah. yeah. So that's, uh, that, that's, I think, uh, our two important elements of it. So, so we have like, uh, what does it mean to work with the organization as, uh, in, in owning a product? Um, what does it mean to understand the market and, and not just from a customer perspective, but also from a competitor perspective, from a, uh, uh, uh from a technology perspective. So, so these are these are all really important things uh, in owning a product. I would say uh, because without contextual awareness, uh, you're lost. Mm -hmm. uh, no. I, I, I watched. I happened to watch the Pirates of the Caribbean <laughs> um, the other day, and mm -hmm. I think it's like being you know this thing is about your ship on a sea. It's constantly changing. You have new ships coming around. You, your crew is changing. Um, you know all of these changes, that is your context and it's not stable. I've never seen a context that is stable. It, it keeps on changing all the time. So I, for me, the key word here is navigating all of your context, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and maybe to add a little bit to it, you know, uh, if you take that pirate met metaphor a bit, a bit uh, further, um, yeah. <laughs> having a treasure map. Yeah. So, 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 so you need to you need to have some hunch on where the value might lie, mm -hmm. and, and 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 yeah. So, so, so where's the where's the gaps that you could be filling with your product? Uh, uh, that's the where's that where's the gold that could be uh, exploited, basically. And the that's... real treasure map never only has one treasure, right? There's so many options, so many opportunities. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. yeah figuring out which of these are we going to go for. Given our context, our people, our product, our market, our business model, all of yeah. those things that you need to navigate, right? Mm -hmm. no. risky. How risky is it if we keep going with this pirate analogy, right? It will break at some point. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll push it. We'll see how far we can take yeah. it. <laughs> um, yeah, is there? Um, we can we can dive more into evolving with validation if you if you guys are happy with what we've said yeah. about value I'm good here yeah. let's do it um same thing i think and this is it, it seems a little repetitive but i think it's important to to call out what we think is most important about each of these because there are so many elements and skills underneath of them and in, in various levels but 
to help people kind of zero in on on what is the most important thing with evolving with validation. What do you guys think? So I think for uh, anyone on the call here that comes from a scrum background, the word validation here is, rings very closely to empiricism, mm -hmm. you know, figuring out something that is true that you can observe, getting data and then looking at that data and thinking about, hey, this situation that we're in right now, is this where we want to be or do we want to be somewhere else? So how do you get that data? How do you make sure that data is actually telling you what you need to learn? That's what we're talking about here. So, I mean, on the left side of this bubble here is where we have classical mm -hmm. Scrum and Agile uh, principles of, you know, incrementally uh, evolve your product, et cetera. But on the right is also where you, okay, so what are those incremental steps? What are the iterative steps? Where do we need to go back? Where, what have we learned about, you know, something that might have been true two years ago is not valid anymore. So it's also about revisiting these things and being explicit about like in the treasure map, we have so many options. Do we really think there is a treasure on that island? What tells us this? Is this because we have some rumor or is it because we have some other data that gives us, giving us some insight, telling us, hey, we should go here. Yeah. Can we do it? Yeah, Paul? Yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, let's go back to the pirate metaphor, see if we can break it. <laughs> so so another, another important thing is, you know, uh, uh, if you're doing Scrum, you're, you're delivering down product. Yeah. So, so, so that means that's quite an investment to get some, uh, to get some, uh, to get some feedback. And I think, uh, uh, what we, what we're doing as, uh, what we've been doing as pirates is we, we've been sailing through those islands and start digging like, uh, uh, way too much. And, and what, what's only like a recent discovery of the past 10 years is that you can also send your parrot. If you're, if you teach your parrot, uh, your parrot can just fly over there. You don't have to sail all the way. So, so there's many ways to discover where the treasure is, other than building the entire product, mm -hmm. like we like we so emphasize in Scrum, right? You know, like delivering down product that was great. So there's a whole area of discovery and validation, yeah, you know, uh, uh, that wasn't there when Scrum was invented. But that's only like like more recent discovery that there's so much to be had uh, without investing too much. There we could collect so much data without investing too much. So that's that's like a a, a big part of this evolve with validation as well. Um, yeah, actually, well, this, I'd to... go ahead, Frederick. Well, this kind of the way you're doing this kind of powers everything else, right? You want to be data informed. You don't want to take too much guesses because that's, it's just, just guesswork. It's still gonna be a level of guesswork, but you can start validating <laughs> some of those assumptions and clarifying what, what are the assumptions we're making here. Mm -hmm. You know, we are making the assumption that our boat is gonna make it across the shore. We, we have make the assumption we have the skills needed to get here. We, we are making assumptions that we can satisfy a, a need or a wish for a, a stakeholder and that we identified it correctly. There's just so many assumptions, right? Yeah. First, so, they, um, sum it up as like, how do you know? How do you know yeah. you're in the right direction, right? Like that's the, yeah. that's the big, it's the million dollar question, right? Yeah, yeah. And and how do you decide what you want to learn? Mm -hmm. Which of these things do you need to validate, and which of them are just wow? Well, let's accept the risk. We assume this is right. Let's go with it. Mm -hmm. That's a trade off. So this kind of fuels the rest of what we're doing. These are core skills yeah. in fast moving markets. So Why did we put the stars? Why did we put the stars? <laughs> we wanted to emphasize <laughs> these. Um, this is, yeah. I don't know if, if you guys have noticed um, in, in your work with organizations and teams that, you know, are they are they focusing on this experimentation mindset or have you encountered organizations and teams that are or aren't and how has that been helpful to them or, or useful to delivering value to their customers? I, I I wouldn't mind spending uh, one more minute on this, actually. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, we, we really we uh, have identified these as uh, so we're assuming that this is like really really important in product ownership, and 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 it's getting way too little attention. So that's our assumption. Uh, we're actually building stuff around it right now, uh, and we're trying to validate whether uh, that assumption that we're making is correct. So, so we're really, uh, we're really, and we're really uh, passionate and excited about it. And it, it, it seems that uh, uh, people uh, working on product uh, are as well. 
so that's that's why we, we're trying to highlight these things you know mm-hmm. sort of a first branch of of hey this is important uh, for to learn in owning a product these are yeah. certainly key capabilities and being able to do this experiment deliberately many times over put some hard constraints or challenges on your on your organization and your technology are you able to run a b tests you know 10 of them in a week are you able to validate your assumptions quickly um, do you have you know the setup because you have to be close to your customers right you have to be close to your users in order to get this data so by focusing on these things you're going to draw a lot of um, it's going to force you to start doing a lot of other very good important things and if you don't know how to do all of these things it's still it's going to be hard to excel in the other areas yeah so that's actually um speaking of how do how do i get to you know more familiar with some of these capabilities and skills what can i do with this material um i know we have we have several products already that that are helpful to people there there are courses uh, for example PSPOA um PSPO there are certifications and assessments that we have um there's a ton of free resources on the website uh and going back to this model and you know a more holistic view of this and how we envision or at least how I envision people would use this is you know as a product owner as a product manager as a product leader you can take a look at this uh, framework or model, um, and you know, do a little self-assessment for yourself. There's there's much more description under each of these skills and capabilities on the website, and if you click that, or you know, if you scan that QR code, you'll land right on that page. Um, but you can absolutely start to self-assess for yourself. You know, like how well do you think you are doing with each of these skills? How well do you think you are leading people with that to value? How well do you think you you and your teams and your organization are evolving with validation? Um, so that is that is something that you could start with right now. And, and of course, you know, there's there's a teaser of, you know, coming soon. This is something that we're very focused on at Scrum.org right now. So this is honestly the the beginning of the story for professional product ownership for us. Um, and I expect mm. much more on the horizon. I couldn't tell you exactly what it is yet because we're trying to uh, drink our own champagne a little bit and discover uh, where where we would go next. But we have some idea. Um, Frederick or Paul, did you want to add anything to that? How can I uh, just think you, you you meant rum and the you know <laughs> rum? <laughs> yeah, drink our own rum. <laughs> exactly. Yes, <laughs> we explore mean. this yeah this space as well, right? It, it's it's uh, it's an ocean, and there are lots of opportunities. Uh, yeah, yeah. But then there's a, there's you know, and there's a million there's a million things we could start doing with it. Uh, yeah. But we need to figure out, hey, what is it uh, that people need? Uh, 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 how how can we best help uh, them uh, grow uh, in product ownership? Uh, so so that's like, yeah. And I also I also kind of want to come back to um, this this picture as a whole, you know, and our expectations of professional product ownership. I, there's there's something here that. Uh, you know, do do we, maybe you guys can help me answer this question. Do we expect any one person to be able to do all of these things extremely well? Maybe that's something we could clarify about our intent with this. So uh, uh, I, you almost had the, had the same question earlier and I was thinking about the bakery across the street here. I think there are like five people operating that that company and they do all of this. Of course they do, right? But then you said, are they doing it well? Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's a relative scale, right? It doesn't exactly tell you, you know, what well means. So can they learn to do this better and in other ways? I'm sure they can, right? If you look at a bigger company, a bigger product than just bread um, um, uh, and, and pastries and stuff like that, is it possible for one person to excel and do all of this work? Uh, no, I don't think I don't think that's possible. So what do you it, think it, it's, yeah. sorry. What do you do then? You take a hard look and think about, so this is what our company is going to have to do mm-hmm. in order for us to you know, be successful with our products. And then ask yourself, who is going to do this? How are we going to do this? And again, like your context is not going to be identical to, to your neighbors. 
because you have different people, different skills, different products, different markets, etc. So you have to figure out what are the right way to do this is for us. Of course, there are basic skills, you know, um, and, and, and you can go figure out and learn what those are, but then how to apply them to your context. That is always going to be specific to you. Does that make sense? I believe so. If I could sum it up, it's, um, you know, owning a product entails all of these capabilities and skills, but it may not lie with any one single individual person to be able to do all of these extremely well. And that's where you you might lean on other other people in your organization, other teams, other parts of your organization for help. Um, but owning a product does mean all of these things. So where can you get yeah. help? Yeah. Yeah. If you're using Scrum, you uh, have this thing called product owner. You know, there is an accountability and expectation that for your team working on your product, there is a responsibility called product owner, and the, that is product ownership, right? And that person, usually from the most, you know, the, the companies and organizations I've seen, that means they need a whole lot of help. They're not going to be able to do all of this by themselves. And it, it, that is not the intent either. The intent is for, you know, your team or your company to figure out how do we do this in a way that is successful and helping us meet our clients' needs and our own um, desires as well. Yeah. And, and of course, this is this is also a way for product owners and, and those with product ownership accountabilities to, to upskill also. So while we don't expect any one person to be able to do all of these, there's still opportunity for, for growth as an individual, where would you, how would you advise people to, um, like, where would you start? How do you decide where to start as an individual looking for growth opportunities? Mm -hmm. I think it's sort of, the, the, Fredek sort of mentioned it already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's like, it's, it's, it's like, it's like the how you do it, you know, with the evolve with validation, experimenting deliberately, Applying mm -hmm. experimentation te techniques, that's sort of a driver to address a bunch of the other important stuff. So, mm -hmm. so when you start doing that, you immediately hit value, and that's the that's the most important one, you know, because uh, it's all about uh, value for customers and value for the business, right? So, so, so I think that that might give a good point. There is like, hey. Can we do it like that? Can we be uh, can we be data informed and deliberately experiment? Uh, that's based on outcomes, impacts. Uh, th that's and if you can't, yeah, because uh, a lot of people are in a position where uh, they 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 have they have the name, but they're not really able to do that. And, and some people talk about that in terms of, hey, I'm a component team. Hey, I'm a feature factory. These kinds of things. Mm -hmm. At least figure out where is it done. Where is it done? Can I get there, or can I link what I'm doing to uh, these kinds of things in one way or the other? You know, even though I don't care how far in the basement you are of your mm -hmm. company, uh, mm -hmm. it's it's still about that at the end of the day. So where is it? No. You don't need. Um, no. You don't need the the ideal amount of authority to get started with us people have a lot more agency than they typically expect and if yeah. you can focus on value and help your organization create value for yourself and your for your end users that is something that is welcome in all of the organizations i've seen so if you start by being good at you know collecting data and thinking about what's the value and then focusing in on that that is going to be set you off in a very good start yeah. <clears throat> awesome um Lindsay, how are we doing on time? I think we can we can take some questions. Great, we have some great questions that came in. Um, we are good on time. We still have twenty minutes on our okay. audience's calendar, so let's dive into some questions. So, this question I thought was really interesting. So, Octavian asks, "Can product ownership survive without Scrum slash agility?" Did I love you, that question. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, what did about, you say product owner or did you say, what well, can you rephrase Product that? ownership. Can product right. ownership survive without scrum slash agility? 
So in my perspective on that is yes, you know, you can do product ownership and you are doing product ownership in your company, whether or not you're using Scrum or, uh, uh, or, or any other framework, you know, you, your company is owning your product. The question is, are you doing it intentionally, deliberately experimenting and learning, etc. So absolutely, can they do it without agility was the other part of that question, right? And I think agility, being able to adapt to complexity, being able to make sense of uh, complexity, et cetera, that, do you need that skill? Well, most, most companies need that skill. Um, and it's not the same for everybody. Um, there are different types of products, you know, and so um, a level of agility, being able to address complexity and adapt your organization to go for value reorganize around what's valuable and opportunities you see. I think those are very good capabilities of an organization. Yeah. So the answer to the second bit is no, <laughs> not without agility. Hmm. And you, at some point, people uh, might not even call it agility anymore. Uh, no. It might be about adaptability or whatever, but it's the same thing. You know, it's, uh, it's being able to navigate in complexity and, uh, and uh, and deliver 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 outcomes and impacts. No. Great value, yeah. And if if you can't do it, if you can't adapt to the changing ocean of this pirate bay, you know, as the pirate story, then someone else will. You know, no. it is increasingly a global world market, and uh, if you're not figuring out how to create new value for your customers and end users, someone else will. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you all. No. Okay, so next question from Mark. How can the PO and PM better fit together to ensure defined roles and responsibilities are known and exist? Any tips there? So the PM would be product manager. I would I'm assume. assuming product manager. Mark, please correct us if you mean project manager. So how so, can product owner and product manager better fit together? Yeah. The way I suggest you do that is to sit down with something like, you know, the, the flower that we looked at previously with all of these different skills and capabilities and et cetera. And you just talk them through, like, what do we mean when we say provide direction with goals and roadmaps? What does that entail? You know, both of you think about it and then think about, okay, so how do we overlap? How do we support each other? Um, how do we know if we're doing well in this area? So do it together is what I'm recommending and figure out, you know, and draw some Venn diagrams or something like that and just figure yeah. out how are we going to do this? And don't think that that's going to fit your product and your market forever. You might have to revisit this. If you take on two new teams, wow, that changes everything typically uh, if you double your size or something like that. So don't think of it as a fixed thing. Uh, thing no. or a solution. Do it more dynamically. Revisit it and and, and be flexible and adaptable in that space too. Yeah, and and I think yeah, key is to talk about what is needed to uh, what is needed for this product. And you could use uh, the tree or the flowers for that. Uh, but also uh, figure out how you're gonna collaborate because you because you're gonna you're gonna. You're gonna have a, a hard time uh, collaborating if you don't make agreements on that. Um, and I think one of the most important parts in that is, you know, uh, if you have like a PMPO combination, uh, it tends to be way too much outside in. No? So, 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 so the inside out, like, okay, we have new capabilities now, we can create new value, uh, is 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 often uh, underserved. Uh, well, that is a very important part of uh, owning a product nowadays. So. Oh. Awesome. Hope Thank that's you. helpful. Yeah. No. And just for the real quick for the the tree and the flower references, um, it's the same thing. This <laughs> this graphic used to be a tree like structure, and now it's a flower like structure. So yeah. if you're confused about the tree flower reference, it's this. It's this. It's the same yeah. thing. Yeah. But Frederick started calling it flower all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> it does look more like a flower now, I think. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. 
So um, this question from Miguel, what's the difference between innovation and improvement? Oh, um, I don't know if, uh, in, I would like to know what difference it makes to you, but it's hard to get that feedback right now. <laughs> um, innovation means it's a, it's a new offering. It should, it helps, um, it moves you in some way. You can be innovative about your business model. So you're offering to engage with your company or, or your product in a new way. Um, doesn't have to be in that you mean bring new features or even uh, Well, new type of pastry. is it something like uh, you're solving a new problem? It could be. It could be it's that you're solving a new problem, but it could also be that you're solving a problem, the same problem, but in a new way. Right. So Yeah. it just means we're offering something new that you didn't see before. Uh, and that can absolutely be an improvement. You know, or uh, what was the word Yeah. uh, Mark used? Innovation. Yeah, innovation and No. improvement, right? Uh, Yes, and improvement correct. can certainly be at innovation if you think it's something that we haven't offered before. If it's just tweaking and optimizing, eventually perhaps it feels like this is something, it enables me to do something completely different than the, for sure that, that is a type of innovation. Yeah, for me, that 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 innovation uh, versus improving is, is sort of sort of ties back into the the, the change and run, or or uh, doing the project and uh, and maintaining and maintain and, and and handing it over to maintenance. So that that, that that's the association I make, and then often they uh, they call the stuff that's being done in maintenance or in the run they call that the improvements. So it's like smaller things or something, but I don't know. I don't know if that's, yeah, that whole model is a bit uh, outdated uh, as far as I'm concerned uh, to distinguish between the two. No. Yeah, you could think of it as you have trying to learn two different things, right? So some people would say that innovation means I'm trying to figure out the right problem to solve. Like, does customers, does anyone in the world ever actually care about this? And if you figure out, ah, they actually care about this problem, they have this situation or this opportunity, let's go for that one. And then you move into, okay, so we have a basic something way to meet that need. Now we're just going to improve it, but we're, we're still st staying on the same problem. And the, so that one way to look at it for sure, and you might operate a bit differently, but the core skills and, you know, about experimenting deliberately and those kind of, you know, are we collecting the right data to prove our uh, hypothesis and assumptions about what we're doing is still going to be the same. Yeah. No. Hope that's helpful. Awesome. Thank you. If that helps. So this next question from Haley, we're going to pivot a little bit. So um, we're going back to the the pirate analogy. R. Um, <laughs> so would would your scrum master be the first mate in this analogy? Um, <laughs> yeah. but but truly, if it isn't. part of the session today, is there anything where we can find more about the scrum master and product owner relationship and delivering value together? Any, anything Yeah. to add there? So, yeah, I uh, so so with this product ownership thing, we're not specifically looking at Scrum or the accountability or the product owner accountability. So, so we're also not specifically tying it into, hey, the product owner accountability doing all of this and the uh, the Scrum Master accountability and how how could they support it? So, so, so if I want to talk about it in a more more general way, just like we talk about product ownership, so what what I think is there will always be a need, and and, and the way I phrase it is a bit is a bit weird maybe. But you you have you have someone you have someone who's who's building that product, who's trying to create value with that product, or, or someone or, or 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 a responsibility, and then you have a responsibility of someone who is uh, who is not just uh, is not concerned with that, but you have a responsibility of someone who's who's trying to build the best machine to uh, to do all of these things with. Yeah. 
So it, and, and and building a machine sounds a bit uh, mechanic, but it's about uh, uh, hey, how can these people bring their best to work? It's about what that type of structures and process do do we need to have in place? Uh, how do we need to structure our organization? Um, uh, how can we uh, not just improve the product, but also improve the way we do the product? So, so people like that will always be necessary, and 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 that's just in, from the Scrum perspective that's tied into the uh, to the to the accountability of Scrum Master. But hey, you know, yeah, you, you have these things like agile coaches and change managers and who knows what. It's basically people that are building the system that you can build products with. And 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 that's uh that's that's the relation I think and that's that's how I see the responsibility of uh the scrum master accountability specifically then is to provide a product owner if we stay in scrum with the best the best possible value delivery machine if you want to call it like that uh possible. Awesome. Thank you. And that touches on a few oh. of the other questions that have come in as well. Hmm. So I hope you all thought so, that was useful. To the oh, point of the, of, the, of the boat analogy, I think, you know, you, you must remember that both of these accountabilities in Scrum, they're inside the same boat. It's not like I right. can only care about this and you can only care about that. That's not how a well-functioning ship works. Or uh, I'm not a perfect sailor, so I, I shouldn't go too deep into this, but... Um, yeah. You know, if you want to look at Scrum idea, look at the first sentence of how they describe the product owner. You know, your job is to maximize the value for your product as a result of the work done. If your people are, do not have access to the right people, they don't have the skills, tools, environment, whatever it is, context, you need to provide that. And, you know, if they're not collaborating in a good way, they don't have, you know, meaningful, valuable, value creating interactions. The scrum master is certainly someone that, or an agile coach is someone, certainly someone that should be able to help you out here, right? Uh, to make people perform better and have, you know, create better value together. In the same Thanks. boat. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So I'm torn between which question to ask here. Um, just so you all know, um, we will be sharing these questions with our panelists here after the session and we'll figure out a way to get them answered. Um, thank you for your patience there. So there is someone, Anastasia, who asked us to go back to the slide with the, with the four quadrants, um, with the axes, um, to mm -hmm. go through, just overview okay. that again. They weren't sure if they fully understood the message. Um, and I think it'd be good to do a quick overview of this um, to kind of wrap this up. Sure. So I think um, there's there's two slides with two different axes. Um, one is about- I think the, she like, might've met both. Both, okay. There, this one is about the, the landscape of organizations and how they're structured today with their- uh, and accountabilities within there. So how much are these organizations supporting empowered ownership and how much are they aligned to product orientation versus uh, project orientation and not a lot of empower, empowerment with uh, people who they might be calling product owners, for example, or project managers or, or leads or whichever. Um, and Can this- we give an example? Yes, please do. <laughs> so in the bottom, you know, access here, product orientation, if you're more towards the left, you care more about task execution. Like, did we get this done? Is it done? Have we shipped? Have we uh, created the button? Blah, blah, blah. Whereas yeah. the war, if you're more to the right, you care about, did we solve this problem? You know, did we make the customer happy? Did we reduce the time they have to spend in order to accomplish something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as you go up, it's uh, the empowerment axis is <clears throat> how much mandate or decentralized decision making maybe is a is another way to look at it yep. um are you taking orders from the top down or are you empowered in your in your local um localized teams to make decisions um and, and you could and almost <clears throat> yeah you could almost use the same question like and if you're if you're towards the bottom you're given tasks mm -hmm. do this complete this finish this whereas on the top again you're more like hey could you go help customers achieve this 
could you help us solve this uh, market problem? And then this axis is, uh, Frederick, do you want to uh, compare this this axis to the previous slide axis? Compare it. Well, we have strategy and execution. There, um, I, this so is about an accountability, the accountability itself, where this one is more about the, the organizational environment, I think. You think that's uh, good enough, Lindsay? Or should we clarify this even further? I, I think that's good. Um, mm -hmm. And if there's any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to us. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that would be great. So to kind of close this out, is there any closing message that you all want to share? Yes. <laughs> I will... Um... I will stick it in in the chat also because I um, I overlooked adding this slide uh, to the deck, <clears throat> which I'll do before we send it out to all of you. But but you know this uh, this model that we've shared with you today is also an assumption of ours that we're validating. So um, if there's if you have stories uh, to share about it, if there's anything that you agree with uh, or disagree with, or you think that we've overlooked. Related. Sabrina, I hate to stop you. Could you reshare that to everyone? You only shared it post and panel. Oh no! Yes, and I can't copy and paste and zoom. No worries. Um, well, I think I can't. But um, oh, let me fix oh, that. Okay, you it, should be able to. Sorry about that. No worries. Sorry to you all. I uh, actually can't copy. Anyhow, the the ask is, you know, we'd love to hear your your experiences and how you are, uh, you know, how how is this model useful to you? Are you able to use it? Have you used it, um, you know, at some point in the future? Let us know if you have used it and if it's made a difference in in your product mm -hmm. and all delivering value to your customers. Um, how mm -hmm. I would love to hear about that is, I think right now through LinkedIn, if you would tag scrum.org and hashtag uh, professional product ownership, that would be fantastic. And then we can see a lot of those things together in one place. Um, and of course, you're always welcome to, to message us privately or individually or on, on LinkedIn or through email. Um, I'll throw this back up here. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I, I just, guess my point yeah. is that we're also wanting to learn how useful this model is to you. It's not a, you know, here is a perfect model, please go use it. We also would like to know if it's useful so that we can evolve it. Yeah, I have a, Maybe one thing, uh, uh, Lindsay, will there be a possibility for us to answer questions after the webinar or no? Yes, we can We can regroup and um, you can choose yeah. to reach out to people individually or yeah. we can figure out blog posts. Yes. Yeah, because we don't, we don't have time to uh, answer all the questions in the webinar, but uh, I, uh, because there's questions that are yet unanswered, uh, I'd love to go over them and... Uh, and, and, and try to answer them after the webinar. So. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Okay. So yes. thank you everyone. This is how you can connect with our panelists. Um, everyone's on LinkedIn. So please connect and share any additional questions or thoughts with us. And we hope everybody got value out of today's session. So. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sabrina, Paul, and Frederick for your time. And thank you. Oh. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Thank Ciao. you.